Good evening and welcome to Newsmax Prime. I'm J.D. Hayworth. Of prime interest tonight, practical safeguards and presidential politics. Given the willful blindness of our current commander-in-chief, those who hope to succeed Obama tell us how things would be different were they in the Oval Office. Meantime, a mixture of frustration and amazement on Capitol Hill as lawmakers get another dose of the same old song and dance from bureaucrats who are supposed to implement policies that protect us. If you were here with us last night, you saw just how frustrated Senator Ron Johnson became when addressing the challenges of tracking down terrorists right here in our homeland. We are searching for needles in a haystack, and the problem is there are more needles and the haystack is growing, which is what is disturbing about President Obama's continuing denying of reality that his strategy isn't working to defeat ISIS, which is, I think, the number one objective we really need to accomplish is, is we do need to accomplish his stated goal, degrade and ultimately defeat ISIS. The problem is his vision of ultimately is a lot further in the future than my vision. For more on the story, let's welcome in political commentator Pat Buchanan. Pat's more than a commentator. He knows his way around the White House, former senior advisor to Presidents Nixon and Reagan. And Pat, of course, is the author of the book, The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from Defeat to Create the New Majority. Pat, I want to get to presidential politics in just a minute. But first, the policy that may influence the presidential campaign, specifically the massacre in San Bernardino, Today we learn the man in that attack had been plotting an attack as far back as 2012. How on earth could we have missed this guy? I think we probably don't have enough resources and we're bringing in an awful lot of people into this country whom we have no idea of how we're going to be able to vet. To vet. Uh, look, that this whole San Bernardino thing is really underscoring a point that basically was made by Donald Trump when he said, look, if we can't vet these folks coming in from the Islamic world where all these wars are going on, Sunni versus Shia and Al-Qaeda and ISIS, maybe we ought to have a moratorium, a temporary timeout on mass immigration into the United States until we correct our system or reduce the numbers coming in. And I'm hearing you say right there that Trump has put forth an idea that you would agree with, but should we take it further, not just Muslims, but really, anybody coming in, do we need a complete moratorium on immigration and visas? You know, I argued for that in 1992 in my campaign for president and 1996 and 2000. J.D., I agree with that for many, many reasons. First, the United States is, is basically not, uh, does not have a need for millions more people. We do have a need for tighter and better security of those who are coming in. We do have a need to to keep the job market tight, to enable the minorities especially and working class white folks to get jobs and get pay, pay raises. Many, many reasons. I don't see an advantage. What tremendous advantage is there to the United States by hurrying to bring one or two or three or four million more folks in, especially from a part of the world where Islamists are fighting one another? So you are citing a theme that you sounded in your presidential campaigns. Donald Trump brings it up with a little bit of a variation now in uh, for the 2016 race. I'm just kind of curious because I was there in Washington, especially in 96, and the establishment was terrified of your candidacy. Just how afraid is the Washington establishment right now of Donald Trump? J.D., the establishment is unhinged. It is unhinged in the incredible overreaction using terms like fascist and Nazi and Hitler and Mussolini to Trump's suggestion about a temporary moratorium on immigration from the Middle East until we find out how we can vet folks a lot better than we're doing right now. I think the American establishment's reaction to the Trump campaign, I mean, he stood up also for what? He stood up for a trade policy which stops the shipping of jobs and factories overseas. We lost six million uh, jobs in the first uh, manufacturing jobs in the first decade of the 21st century, 55,000 factories. It is simple common sense. What is at risk, I think, for the establishment is its whole religion upon which it is based Cold War or post-Cold War policy. Trump is a great threat to that establishment, and they can sense it. And you see it in the hysterical reaction. Hysterical, J.D., 
to what Trump said down there in South Carolina. And what did, how did the people respond? Republicans by three to one thought he had a fairly good idea. And the nation is not opposed, I think, to the idea of stronger border controls and fewer immigrants until we fix it up. Now, adding to that hysteria, Pat, uh, again, talk that Trump might walk away from the Republican Party and run as an independent. What do you make of this renewed talk? Been there, done that myself, J.D. (laughs) Yeah. And what's your advice to Trump? I think that would result in the election of Hillary Clinton, as I discovered, when, you know, once I announced and broke, I was at 15 percent nationally. I mean, you lost immediately almost half of your support. And more than that, people would come up to you and say, Pat, you know, I love you, but we got to get rid of Clinton and Gore. And so I think I, I would hope that doesn't happen. But I would also look, you got to somebody's got to tell the Republican Party, look, you might everybody's advising you how you get rid of Trump. But you you destroy him. You destroy his issues or you deny his issues and arguments. Where do you think those people are going to go? They're going to stay home. The whole message of this campaign, frankly, and it's also to a degree in the Democratic Party, is that the American establishment since 1991, the end of the Cold War, has utterly failed America and resulted in one after another defeat in foreign policy and in trade policy and in the ability to control our borders. At this stage of the campaign, are you willing to endorse Trump if he remains a Republican? You've given him that public advice. I'm just curious. Are you ready to make a public stance on behalf of any candidate? Well, I don't think I, I ought to get involved in, in endorsing. You know, I'm a columnist commentator, and you do, and I do issues. But I will say this. Look, if Donald Trump wins that, wins that nomination, I'm going to hope and pray he wins the general election. I would certainly vote for him here in Virginia. But I would, you know, I don't want to get my own name into the uh, into the mix of who's for, who's against, and things like that. I'm out of that business, J.D. <laughs> All right, well, let me, let me take you to another part of the business. Advising Reince Priebus, the Republican National Committee, and the Washington establishment. They always tell conservatives, gee, we got to all get together. What is it going to take to get the establishment Republicans to really have a big tent and include guys like Donald Trump? 30 seconds. Well, you're going to have... What they're going to have to do is I don't care who wins the nomination, but I think that the Bush Republicans, if you will, and the Cruz Republicans and the Trump Republicans and all of them need to be up on that stage together supporting and endorsing that nominee. Or if they do, I think they got a good chance to win the election. But a House divided will not win this election in November 2016. Sage advice from Patrick J. Buchanan, author of The Greatest Comeback. How Richard Nixon rose from defeat to create the new majority. Pat, we thank you for your time.